You're tuned in to the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB, brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi and Small Town Music. You're about to hear a conversation with Ted Ganey. He's a Mississippi songwriter and multi-instrumentalist who is studied in the art of recording. If you dig into his catalog, which you can find on YouTube, you might actually find yourself hearing color. Now Jesus was a Jew that goes without question. Ganey has spent years exploring musical textures. In today's show, you're going to find out why these songs sound the way they do and how they're crafted to tell stories. And if you've never heard of an ADAT machine, you'll find out what that is too. As Ted Ganey joins us, he's poured himself a cup of coffee and settled into a comfortable chair. You might do the same. Well, Ted Ganey, uh, tell me about Ted Ganey. What is it that you do? I mean, you've been on the show before. People have heard your voice before. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is it? uh, What kind of music is this? Because I was looking for a word to try to describe it uh, whenever I was listening Mm -hmm. to your catalog. And the word that I came up with is ethereal. Okay. That's good. Um you know, I have no preconceived notions about music. Um, I've been blessed to play with a lot of different great musicians in Mississippi from all different genres. And, uh, you know, I was never really in cover bands. All the bands I was in were, we, you know, were there was either a singer-songwriter that the band was built around or it was a, a group effort. You know, and uh, so, you know, being a 90s kid, when I first started, you know, I liked the heavier, more aggressive stuff. And uh, I was in a band called Scapegoat way back in 93. And we did just kind of weird, kind of rap rock, but it had this other like psychedelic element to it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> then when that band disbanded, I was in a band called Wobbity, and we just put out an, an LP. And that, the last time I was on the show talking to Jim, that's what we were talking about. Uh, it's available on vinyl as a limited edition, but we recorded everything. Um, one of my mates, Tom Keha, had some recording uh, equipment. Uh, he had an ADAT and uh, some mix of grand sound at a club and. I should recall Proud Larry's in the gin and I actually met him at the gin. And uh, so we would just get together and jam and write music and record it. And, and so almost 30 years later, it's finally seeing a physical copy. You know, it's just been stored on tapes for years and years. And uh, so that was kind of heavy, aggressive, but it was also kind of hip hop and jazz and fusion. Um, it's not streaming everywhere, but you can go to Wobbity, which is W-O-B-I-T-T-Y-H-Q, WobbityHQ.com, and you can do digital downloads of that album or physicals, if you like it. We got CD and vinyl. I got to ask you, where did the name Wobbity come from? (laughs) That's a good question. Um, the term Wobbity is a friend that uh, is a is a term that a friend of mine from Canton, Andy Bone, uh, coined, and basically it's uh, you know how when you sit in front of a computer for too long or you sit from the TV for too long and you just kind of bombarded by uh, whatever kind of information you're doing and you just you just kind of get the sensation that kind of zoned out or spaced out that's the wobbity (laughs) that's the wobbity we would yeah we would spend hours and hours in the mixing room mixing stuff and we would just get what we call wobber fried um you know paying attention to every little detail and getting zoned in so much to where you just it was almost just like a psychedelic thing you know but that's what the term means um but uh, we were glad to have that come out, 
And then uh, also was lucky around the same time that I started playing with the Kudzu Kings, which were totally different. That was when the jam band scene started happening or, you know, it, it was doing well and uh, played with them throughout the Southeast off and on from the nineties all the way up to about, well, I took a hiatus. I've retired from playing live twice in my life and uh, I'm no longer doing it now, but I, I play with them some, uh, in the past few years and they just put out a double live LP, uh, that I was lucky enough to play on. And, um, I think you go to kudzukings.com if you want to order that. Now, what is your and primary then, instrument? I, 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 don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, I, I was listening to a lot of your stuff, and I got the impression that you were playing a lot of the instruments on the tracks that you sent me. Yeah, on my solo stuff, I am. Now, on some of the stuff, I will, um, I will ask friends that I've played with through the years to humor me, and I'll send them a track. Um, I know some really talented guys that I can send something to and they'll send me a file back there. It'll just be magic. You know, it'll be the, it'll be the, the thing that makes the song, you know, otherwise it's just me playing, you know, normally I start off on guitar and then I'll come up with a bass, but usually Justin Showa ends up, he's an old bandmate, a friend of mine. Um, we've, been on several records together, but he, uh, he, I can send him a file and he's just like my soul brother when it comes to rhythm. Like he can lock in with what I'm doing and it just feels good. And, uh, but I do play some of the songs. I play everything, but if I feel like it needs that something extra special, you know, I'll send it to a friend that I can really, I, cause I can kind of hear what they would do in my head, I guess, after seeing them and playing with them and, kind of knowing what their flavor is or their color is. And um, so it's not all me, but it does start. It's mostly me in my studio. And um, yeah, I hear a lot of I slides. The, I hear a lot of, I hear a lot of color instruments. I would call them. I always, I tend to cut drums last drums. You to get back to your question. Drums is what I played or I should say drums are what I played uh, with all the bands. I was the drummer. Um, but then when I I kind of got out in 2004, quit touring, quit playing, started a family, uh, but I had a little studio, and that's when I put out my first record in 2008, I think it was. So it took me four years to make the first record. But I was in no rush. And uh, I played most everything on that album. There were a couple of friends. Clay Jones played on a couple of songs. Tom K. Ha played on a song. Robert Chaffee. Uh, who else? I know I'm forgetting somebody. Max Williams. Um, anyway, I'm sure I'll catch hell for not remembering their name, but that was a long time ago. Um did it all in your house, too, yeah, right? Yeah, there are no studios harmed in the making of any of my recordings. They're all done from the comfort of my old home. They kind of have a, a comfortable feeling to them. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. I, uh, <clears throat> Like I said, when I, when I set out to record, I just kind of have kind of an idea of what, a sto what the story is, and I'll kind of come up with a progression. <laughs> But I'm not like, oh, I'm going to write a rock song or I'm going to write, you know, a country song. It's just, I just kind of let the song tell me what it needs. And sometimes I'm capable in my limited capacity to bring it to fruition. But a lot of times I'll <clears throat> send it to a friend and bounce some ideas around or get them to play on it. Coming up, how a song about several families having to share an outhouse became a song about his mom and a special performance just for the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. You're listening to the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. I'm your host, Chris Davis. The Blues and Arts Hour is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi and Small Town Music. For multi-instrumentalist and singer-songwriter Ted Ganey, 
creating a song is not about creating rock or blues or country. It's just about creating a song that tells a story. Now, more of our conversation, and coming up, a special performance for the Blues and Arts Hour. Down the turn road, a hesitant hawk springs from a pine top, a barefoot in One that I was listening to when you, you sent me this, you know, big, long list uh, of songs of yours, the, the catalog, the set list, uh, one I listened to was uh, Rebirth. Of fall, and mm-hmm. when, when I said at first, you know that ethereal was the word that I had come up with. Uh, some mm-hmm. of that came from listening to that song. You know, when I put on the, I, I listened to it in uh, in headphones, and mm-hmm. the stereo mix is really good in it. And you're hearing, oh, you. I think you're hearing the color. I I really do feel like uh, you were able to convey uh, some of that fall color into the music. Oh well, thank you. That's uh, that means a lot. Um, yeah, um, and I'll tell you, a lot of the magic on that was uh, uh, David Gilmore, who a uh, really good guitar player from mine, uh, pedal steel. Uh, he's a great pedal steel player, um, and you know, pedal steel is just a beautiful instrument, and um, it can do that ethereal thing by itself alone. You can just plug a pedal steel in, turn the reverb up, and go to outer space. You know. Well, you know, I, um, I think about uh, "Time Out of Mind," Bob Dylan, and mm-hmm. the use of the pedal steel for uh, for rock. Uh, but the the way they used it in the recording of that album, similar things, uh, just used for it's a different idiom of music. It's not country. And pedal steel is known so much for country music, but oh, yeah. you use it with some uh, with some effects, some reverb, some tremolo, and it becomes an entirely different kind of instrument and can convey some uh, completely different emotions than you would expect. Yeah, it, it's um, it's a great brush to paint with uh, when you're not uh, chicken picking, you know. Um, it's, it can sound like a keyboard. Uh, it can sound like angels, you know. Um, but it's just, it's one of my favorite instruments. I love it. Um, but in every use that, it, that it's used to have. But yeah, that, that song, uh, I take walks every day. And that song came about, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Eric Strasner, who actually recorded his first album that's coming out. March 1st, I'm going to plug his album. Um, I recorded it and met, uh, Matthew McGee played on it. Uh, Jamie Wings played on it. Austin Sorry played on it. Uh, of course, Eric played and sang. Will Kimbrough played on it. I played drums on a couple of songs, but um, it's coming out March 1st and it was done entirely here at my home studio. And um, it's called Super Chief. But Eric and I were talking about fall one day. And uh, he was talking about, we were talking about, yeah, you know, you, you get the seasonal sads. And, uh, you know, you kind of get depressed and seasonal depression and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, but there's also like a beauty to f- just sitting. And it, it kind of allows your soul to be reborn when it gets nice again you know you kind of go you're kind of like a a a daffodil you know or or whatever you kind of go into this dormant mode where you can reflect and um and kind of just sit with the past year and then all of a sudden you know all these things start happening and it's just like this beautiful rebirth you know a lot of people so, associate uh, spring with rebirth, but this is, it's kind of a, taking it from a different angle. Yeah, well, you know, when the leaves start changing, um, they, they're they actually dying, but they're more beautiful, you know? Uh, there are all these reds and yellows and, you know, people drive to the East Coast just for the fall. <laughs> And a murder of crows Or visiting me On my afternoon stroll Down the turn road A hesitant hawk 
of it all I wish that you could recall The rebirth of fall I'll see all these things at the palace on has no appeal The leaves will change and the north wind will blow I still believe that nature knows how to let go Oh, the vastness of it all times people don't stop to appreciate that you know that that the letting go of things is a beautiful thing to do and it's it's nature reminds us to do that every year you know don't carry over into the next year uh anything that you're not willing to to carry over you know Coming up, we're not letting go just yet. We're going to carry over our conversation with another story. This one that comes from East Mississippi and from the songwriting of Ted Ganey on the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. You're listening to the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. I'm your host, Chris Davis. Blues and Arts Hour is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi and Small Town Music. And today, you're hearing a conversation with singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Ted Ganey. Even if you're not a recording buff, even if you're not into the art of recording music, you still might be interested in hearing about a piece of antiquated technology that was once top of the line. It's called ADAT. Well, you mentioned uh, ADAT. And uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about your recording process. I know nowadays everybody's using a DAW or a digital audio oh, workstation. Yeah. But ADAT, mm-hmm. uh, which was you know digital audio tape, that was used by Mississippian Glenn Ballard uh, to record, yes, it was. Uh, you know, to record "Jagged Little Pill," Alanis Morissette, and uh, was, indeed it was for a while. It was, it was kind of gaining some momentum there in the industry before the DAWs took over. Yeah, it um, ADATs were everywhere, uh, and they were very expensive, and they ran on VHS tapes. But you had to format them uh, to where it would turn the you know, on VHS tapes, basically you would have a bunch of information for video 
and then you would have a stereo track of audio on a VHS tape. Well, you would put the VHS tape into the ADAT, and you would format it, and it would format it to be eight tracks of audio. So each each VHS tape would be eight tracks. And it's funny you mentioned Glenn Ballard because he came home and played a show in Natchez. So, uh, this was, I can't remember what year this was. Uh, I've got a poster of it in my music room. But anyway, we were invited, me, Kerry Hudson, uh, um, he's solo now, but he was, you know, he led Blue Mountain for years and years. Mm -hmm. And um, Tate Moore and Dave Woolworth from the Kudzu Kings were invited down to play the after party. He he did this performance, this solo performance in Natchez of songs he had written and produced. And, and I missed the performance because we were, we were setting up, but did get to meet him. I have a picture with him and I have a signed poster of his homecoming in Natchez. So, yeah, that was uh, that's funny that you mentioned that. A lot of people don't know what ADAT is or anything like that, but and and we kind of joke about it. Uh, I was joking with somebody recently about, you know, are people ever going to go, man? You know how everybody's like vinyl now, or they want to go to tape. Is anybody ever going to want that ADAT sound? You know, the black <laughs> face ADAT, not the silver face. So. I've got a few of them in the music room. Maybe if they come back around, I'll be able to. All the all the wobbly stuff was recorded, like I said. But we some of it was two inch. We recorded on two inch, but uh, we transferred it all into Pro Tools and mixed it there. But yeah, I am on I am on Pro Tools. Um, of course, I go. I've got outboard gear that I run through uh, to kind of give us some some circuitry and some analog, an analog stage before it hits uh, digital. And how about another tune? It's called You Never Really Know. I used to just kind of scratch down these, you know, thoughts. And uh, when I got ready to make that record, I didn't really know what direction to go, so I started going through old journals. I used to keep journals a lot when I was traveling. And uh, so I started going through this journal, and I saw this song that I started written started writing i knew exactly who it was about and what it was about and i just kind of twisted it just a little bit uh to protect the guilty yeah that came out pretty good and that's max williams playing dobro on that song it's a cool little kind of country shuffle i guess i was i was when you said that you you wanted that song i was really like oh okay well it caught my ear so he, you, know. he, you did a deep dive yeah okay it's it's one that um it's kind of personal so i don't want to say too much about who or what yeah we have I, these I things like, that uh you know as, as songwriters you end up uh with a code of your own in a way yeah, I guess so. And, you know, I mean, you hope that the listener relates to it in a way that you could never imagine and they make it their own. You know, I, I do that with other people's music. You know, I listen to the songs and I'm like, whoa, I can, you know, that I resonate with that because of this. And um, I'm sure every it's been said a million times, but, you know, once it's out in the world, it's no longer yours. It's the listeners and it's up to them to make sense or not make sense of it. Whereas so. uh, Paul Simon told Dick Cavett, it'll mean something to somebody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those are w sage words from a, uh, a, a very prolific man.
Coming up, the story of Katie May. You're listening to the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. You're listening to the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. Brought to you by Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Mississippi, and Small Town Music. I'm Chris Davis, your host. been spending some time with Ted Ganey, singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist. And if you've been listening, you heard him talk about songs needing to be relatable to people. And some of his songs are quite relatable. And one that you're going to hear in just a minute is one I think that a lot of people who grew up poor in Mississippi can certainly relate to. I want to talk about Katie May. This is one that uh, mm-hmm. you uh, mentioned several times in our correspondence, and uh, a track that you seem to be pretty proud of. Uh, what is it about Katie May that uh, uh, that that kind of gets you going? What what is this track? I wrote that song for my mom, and that song is a true story about my mother, and um, her name is Katie May, and she grew up. Uh, really poor kind of in eastern Mississippi and she lived on this road there were four families so there were four households but none of them had indoor plumbing and they only had two outhouses between the four families so everybody uh, lovingly named the road shit bitch road so <laughs> Uh, I can understand where the first part of that came from, but what about the second yeah. part? Well, it's just, you know, when you have an outhouse, I mean, everything runs into the ditch. 
you know? Gotcha. So, uh, and you got four families using two houses. You live on shit that's road, you know? Uh, but anyway, she laughs about it. And we laughed about it. And she was telling me, and, and that song just kind of wrote itself lyrically. And then I kind of uh, play guitar. I think I, I played bass on it and drums on it and sung on it. I think the only person that, the only thing that I didn't play was I got my friend Kerry uh, Hudson to play some slide on it. And then he also played like this arpeggio guitar part. But um, he really liked it, which made me feel good because I really respect Kerry as a songwriter, especially a Mississippi songwriter who um, definitely has a his own voice and uh, he's a dear friend of mine. And um, when he said, I really like that song, that meant a lot to me. And then my mom didn't hear it while I was working on it at all until it was released. And then I just sent her a link to it. And, and she liked it, so, so it's a that's winner. why I like that song. Yeah, it was kind of a gift, and, and it's a true story, you know. people do it if they need to get a hold of your records they want to hear these uh these songs that we're talking about and playing for them here today what do they need to do i don't really have physicals of anything anymore i think i'm sold out of everything 
and I always do limited runs because I don't tour anymore. I don't play live. I'm, I like the craft of recording. And uh, that's kind of where my head and heart are right now. It's not so much in the live performance, uh, the instant gratification of a live performance. I like the long, long game, you know, spending some time with something, getting really inside of it, trying to make some art that'll last longer than a night, you know. But if any, I mean, everything's streaming. And, you know, you may go to T-Bones and Hattiesburg. They may have, I know they're always really good to anything that I'm involved in and they sell copies. They may have some copies of some things. And I would recommend that the listener just look my name up and, you know, don't judge it by the first or second song you hear. Just hit shuffle because I'm not trying to be country i'm not trying to be rock i just don't know what i am <laughs> it's a variety pack that's for sure yeah it's uh, it's just that's the kind of and that's the way i listen to music too you know i like a good mixtape You've been listening to a conversation with singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Ted Ganey on the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB. The Blues and Arts Hour is brought to you each Friday by Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Mississippi, and Small Town Music. I'm Chris Davis. Tune in next Friday for another edition of the Blues and Arts Hour on 103.9 WYAB.